Making Space Matter. Our moderator for this panel is Jason Kendall, Professor Jason Kendall, who teaches astronomy and physics at William Patterson University and my alma mater, Hunter College. He also um, sometimes speaks on the Weather Channel, so you may recognize him from television. And another claim to fame, if you were here in 2009, he organized the lights out in the park for the Hour of Astronomy. So let's welcome Jason. Thank you, thank you. Hi there, my name is Jason Kendall. It's good to be here. Um, just I'm going to be dealing, uh, introducing uh, three panelists to come up shortly. But what I'd like to do, though, is kind of give an opening remark or a concept about what who I am and what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to actually take some very, very large general ideas and bring them down to high level of very specific things. And so we've got people whose job it is to do that, and we do that through both education, uh, education initiatives, as well as actual engineering initiatives. And that's what we have the three panelists for. But we're going to dominate. We're probably going to talk mostly about educational aspects. Aspects, but we've got certain uh, orbital things that would be wonderful to talk about too. So from my perspective, the reason to go into space um, starts from actually two generations ago in my family. My great-grandfather was a minister out in Indiana and he held all of his sermons under the stars. And so he would always look out among his, because everybody was deadbeat after working in the fields, and he would say, we look up to look within. And so this is an important thing. And he, as my great-grandfather, who taught my grandfather this message, who taught my father this message, who then taught me. And we always remember, because there's so many ministers in the family, that this gesture that I'm doing with my left hand is almost universal with respect to almost every religion, every faith, looks heavenward. So we already do look heavenward for things. And now, now that we can go up there, we can see what we can see by looking back down. So I'd like to now introduce uh, the, because I want to try to stay on target here, I want to introduce our three panelists uh, who are going to be joining me up here. We're going to give a, I'm going to give each of them about five or ten minutes to talk on their various subjects, and then we're going to have a little chit-chat. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew Pierce. He is the Education Program Specialist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Matt has over 22 years, yeah, come on up, uh, has uh, 22 years of diverse leadership, uh, administrative and science teaching experience at all levels of academia. Uh, he is currently employed by NASA Goddard Online Education and Goddard Institute of Space Studies on the campus of Columbia University as an education specialist. He served as a founding space science department chair of a, of the new, of a new school in, for seven years and has worked at NASA for 10 years as a prestigious NASA NEAT educator. Um, he has published many, many published author in genetics, neuroscience, anatomy, physiology, and health science, and received awards for excellence in science teaching from the National Science Foundation, NASA, and Nobel laureate Dr. Francis Crick. Thank you. Give him a hand. Oh, give it up. Thank you, Pierce. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Danielle Wood. She is the Goddard Applied Sciences Manager. She is with NASA, and she is a space systems engineer and researcher with expertise in technology policy for the U.S. and emerging nations. She currently serves as the Applied Sciences Manager at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and her role is to foster the transfer of Goddard's Earth science findings for societal applications such as food security and water resource management. Previously, Dr. Wood served as a special assistant and advisor to the deputy, Man deputy administrator at NASA headquarters in Washington. Prior to working at NASA, she held positions at Aerospace Corp, uh, Johns Hopkins, and the United Nations Office on Outer Space Affairs. Dr. Wood studied at, Mass at MIT, where she got her PhD in systems engineering, a master of science in aerospace, and a master of science in technology policy, and her bachelor of science in aerospace engineering. Let's give it up for Dr. Danielle Wood. And third, but of course not last, Dr. Jeff Goldstein. He is the center director for the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. He is the institute director for the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Space Education. He is a nationally, uh, Dr. Jeff Goldstein is a nationally recognized space educator, space science educator, and planetary scientist who has dedicated his career to the public education understanding of science and the joys of learning. 
As the NCESSE Center Directory is responsible for overseeing the creation and delivery of national science education initiatives with a focus on Earth and space. These include programs for schools, families, and the public, professional development for K-12 educators, and exhibitions for museums and science centers. And all these initiatives are meant to provide a window into the nature of science and the lives of modern day explorers with special emphasis not on what is known on Earth, Earth and space, but how it has come to be known. So please, uh, please welcome Dr. Jeff Goldstein. I'd like to begin first with, uh, with our three, little, with three short presentations. I'd like to start, um, let's see, I guess, Dr. Wood, would you like to care to begin? Starting by turning it on, excellent. Do you guys want to stand up and stretch and just kind of feel yourself here? Enjoy a, a seeing a boat pass by outside. Notice that we can kind of explore as if we're getting a little bit of an overview effect, even from up here on the 48th floor. So welcome, I'm so glad to be with all of you today and thank you for joining. Feel free to sit down. <laughs> so I'm pleased to bring you um, greetings from NASA, especially from the Goddard Space Flight Center. I have another Goddard colleague here with me. We represent a multi-campus uh, research center for NASA where we build and operate many of NASA's satellites that study the Earth. And so I want to share some of my personal story of how I came to be on the NASA team and part of our space community. I want to share about NASA's Earth science community that helps us understand our Earth as a major part of NASA's science activities. And then I'll show ways that you guys can link to NASA data and think about how to take our NASA science results and solve wonderful problems that we're facing here on Earth. So next slide, please. So please join me in Central Florida. It's July 1999. It's a hot, muggy evening, as most summer evenings in Central Florida are, but we're standing just about three miles from the launch pad where the Discover Space Shuttle is going to carry a major X-ray telescope called Chandra to space. Now, it's the third night in a row that we've tried to launch this one, so we don't know if it's gonna go. I'm an intern spending my summer with my first NASA job at Kennedy Space Center. And we've been up till midnight, three nights in a row, hoping to see this launch. First night, there was lightning. The second night, there was some delay. And the third night, finally, it goes off. And you first see the bright lights, you know, lighting up the night sky. You soon start to feel and hear the roar of the engines. And as a 17-year-old, I was hooked. <laughs> I didn't even have to go, but just being a part of this great team and seeing all the work and all the facilities and all the amazing cooperation across many locations in the world to make this kind of thing possible and really inspired me. And it helped me decide that I wanted to find a college education opportunity to study aerospace engineering. Now, this was part of what inspired me as a 17 year old, but other things influenced me as well. My family had kind of trained me to learn about people different than me. I had read about people around the world and I also realized some important things that were different. If you can go to the next slide. I started to realize that there were girls around the world who, unlike me, didn't have opportunities to go spend an amazing summer at NASA. So even though I, I went to MIT and I started studying engineering, the first summer in school, I actually spent my summer in Kenya because I was interested in what's the life like for girls who may be basically kind of like me genetically, <laughs> but they have quite different opportunities than I have. And I spent a summer volunteering with kids from a slum like this. Does anyone know where this might be? Can you guess? It's a famous slum in Nairobi. It's called Kibera. It's one of the, the larger slums there that there were riots there a couple years ago over elections, but it's a place where many young girls live and some of them don't have a safe place to stay because their families are poor or their parents have had to choose difficult lifestyles. And I was able to volunteer at a school that helped girls like this and um, kind of kick them away to a more rural area where they could have a healthier lifestyle. And I was just asking myself, if I study aerospace engineering, does it make a difference in the lives of these girls? At first, I kind of thought, well, no, so I'll just like, be an engineer by day and go off and do volunteer work in summers, and that'll be you know, one way to contribute. But then I realized some important things. If you can go to the next slide. I had a chance to return to NASA again as an intern in my junior year of college, so this time at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. This is a picture of Goddard. It may not look sort of fancy. It doesn't have some of the launch pads that Kennedy Space Center has, but I learned something important there. I learned about NASA's Earth Science satellites. I learned that NASA builds many satellites, right now we've about 20, that orbit the Earth and help us understand what's going on in our environment. And the information from these satellites can help governments and farmers and fisher people and people all around the world make better decisions to make a more safe and productive life. And that makes a difference for the girls that I was volunteering with in Kenya. 
they have challenges with getting access to water when they live in rural areas. They have access uh, to internet questions. So all kinds of things that are affecting their daily life are also linked to these satellites. If you can go to the next slide. I got to learn about a really exciting NASA program that you guys can also uh, think about. It's called Servir. Has anyone heard of Servir? Servir is a Spanish word. Anyone know what, what that might mean? Can you guys guess what it means? Say it loud. It means to serve, right? So it's the Spanish verb which means to serve. And now it's become a global collaboration between NASA and our US Agency for International Development. We realize, of course, that well, like NASA has global view of the world. Our satellites go around the whole world. And we give the data away for free, but if you are a decision maker in a country like Guatemala and you want to use data from NASA, maybe it's not so easy for you to just right away go out and grab it and use it to answer a question you have. But the SEVERE program, it basically takes data from NASA and thinks about particular regions and finds partners with regions around the world. So we have partner groups working in East Africa and West Africa, in the Himalayan region and in Southeast Asia, where we are asking them, what kind of problems do you want to solve with NASA data? How can we help you make the right software tools and maps to solve these problems? And when I realized this, I saw, ah, I can stay in the space industry and I can still be thinking a lot about development questions and how to improve life for girls like the ones I met in Kenya. Next slide, please. So I continued my studies and I ended up doing a PhD focused on small satellite programs in emerging space nations. I became a partner and a research colleague with people all around the world. You see shots here, here in Southeast Asia. I went to Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Turkey, the UAE, places all around the world where they are adopting local technology because they want to also be part of the space community and produce their own satellites because they see that gives them more autonomy in how they get information from space. And so as we heard earlier, anyone can build a satellite now and it's opportunities for countries around the world to think about how they want to use both the global marketplace of data from companies and other governments and from their own satellite expertise to better understand how they want to monitor their own environment. Next slide, please. So I want to make sure that we all kind of have a, a good sense for the role NASA plays in this great adventure we're doing. NASA's mission has you know, many pieces to it, and we're focused today on the Space Apps Challenge and on the questions we're going to ask about Earth. But NASA continues uh, to reveal the unknown and to make sure that we apply that knowledge to benefit all humankind. Next slide. So NASA is located all across the country. I want to make sure you know where NASA is because it's many people working together in a team. We're about 17,000 employees, and that's just the government people. And of course, we have many partners with universities and companies who work closely with us. So we're really a huge family. And you see the locations for centers all across the country. Each center tends to have a certain focus area, but we all work together to really make human spaceflight and space science and Earth science possible. Next slide. So we have four main missions. NASA contributes a lot to aeronautics. We like to say we're with you when you fly. A lot of our research actually improves the next generation of aeronautics technology. A big part of our work is science. We do human exploration, of course, and we develop technology that enables all these other activities. So NASA's budget is on the order of about $19 billion. And again, it's a big number, but it's less than 1% of the overall federal budget. So just remember when people say, why do we spend so much money on NASA? Remember for every penny of tax money that goes in, uh, less than, you know, for every dollar that goes in, less than a penny is going to NASA. So we're doing a lot with, with a small part of the overall budget. And our science budget is about uh, six billion out of that 19 billion. So I mean, it's a pretty healthy size. And out of that six, two billion of that or so is going to Earth. So, you know, of all the things we study, we study all the universe, astrophysics. We study, if you go to the next slide, we study four kinds of science. So it's, it's the sun. We study a lot about our own sun affecting Earth. We study other planets in our solar system, and we study the broad universe. But the Earth is really, in a sense, you could argue, our, our favorite planet, the thing we study, especially uh, where you work as well. We study the Earth very deeply. If you go to the next slide, I'll just show an overview of our current fleet of Earth-observing satellites. They're just shown as dots here, so you can't quite see how they're all different. Notice the International Space Station is one of those because we now have a lot of experiments flying on ISS that are helping us study the Earth. It's cameras and different kinds of sensors looking down at Earth. And what's neat is many of these missions are actually collaborations with other countries. We work very closely with the European Space Agency, with Japan, and really also with our countries around the world, with our scientists as well as our, our engineering, we're always collaborating in, in science, both on orbit but also in the research that we do on the ground. Next, please. And so you can see here another view. I want to highlight from this collection of different kinds of satellites, there's different classes of satellites. Traditionally, we've done very large-scale satellites that have a lot of instruments and last for decades in space, which is great. But also, you're now seeing 
uh, different kinds of missions with smaller satellites, working together as groups. There's a mission called GRACE that has two satellites orbiting together, measuring how gravity feels different across the different parts of the orbit and finding where water versus rock is, even under the ground. Then we have a new set of satellites called Cygnus. It's eight small satellites working together, much cheaper and much faster to build than previous satellites, uh, giving us kind of a new experimental way of measuring winds during hurricanes. So NASA's trying to explore this whole range of big expensive satellites to smaller, cheaper ones that can be built faster. Next, please. So all these amazing satellites give us amazing science understanding of the Earth. The movie you're seeing here gives us one example of a view of life. Green, in this case, representing the chlorophyll, both on the land and in the sea, shows us what we call the biosphere. Where is their life and what's the seasonal change throughout the year? And so I work in a place where we have about 10,000 engineers and scientists, and about 1,300 are doing Earth science. And so I'm surrounded by all these really intelligent PhD-level scientists who every day are giving presentations and sharing their work. And they're answering questions like this. How can we measure where life is on Earth, in this case, in the biosphere? Next, please. They're asking questions like, how can we measure from space and then use models to also estimate uh, where all the rainfall and precipitation is, rainfall, snowfall, other kinds of water falling. This is a map showing uh, kind of a, an animation of uh, where we see rain and snow kind of happening in real time. But it's really a combination of information from many satellites that are global collaboration from several countries working together. You can see the date kind of showing it's, it's, it's been real time going over several dates in 2014. What's important about this is it's not just a matter of measuring things from space. We measure things, we build a model to try to predict and understand how things work together, and then we try to predict the future. So it's an ongoing cycle of improving our science. But just having the science understanding is, is one step. The next step then is how do we use that to make a better decision and make people more safe. Next, please. Here's an example that um, highlights air quality, and I want to show it helps us understand the impact of policies to improve our air quality. Look at the red zones, especially in the US, where you see red is where we had more pollutants that can cause uh, harm to human health through poor air quality. And as you go to the next slide, keep watching that red in the US, and you'll see that it's gone down. From 2005 to 2011, we had a number of policies that helped us actually clean up some areas of air, uh, air pollution, and we already can see the difference from space. So when we really use the information from the science to influence our policies, then we can make a difference in our human lives. Next, please. So here at NASA, we have the Applied Sciences Program, which is one way we encourage people across the world to use our data to um, think about how to solve problems in areas like health and air quality, water resources, understanding the ecology, looking at disaster response, and managing for forest fires. And this year, I'm focusing a lot also on food security. Next, please. Uh, so I just want to sort of do a few examples. We won't go too long, so just to keep the time. But one cool story is understanding how to use uh, data from satellites to identify pathways for where birds can migrate. Birds are often going from North America to South America for many miles, and we want to understand where's the best habitat for them. And here the data was used to inform a policy to help actually pay farmers to not plant so that birds could use their fields during a migration period, but then later after the migration they could then go back to planting. Next, please. Another example is that NASA's uh, satellites can help us understand after a volcanic eruption, we can sense from space where the ash cloud is because that ash is dangerous to planes. So we want to then uh, give alerts to a very coordinated uh, series of groups that think about giving warnings to planes and tell them right away, uh, don't fly in these regions and try to estimate where they can fly in the next 24 hours. Next, please. Another example is the famine early warning system. Information from satellites can be used to understand the current health of crops, looking at how green they are compared to previous years, and try to estimate if we're going to have danger for a famine or a drought. And there's an ongoing effort for actually decades old called the Famine Early Warning Systems. Perhaps you also have some background in that as well. And uh, we've been working closely with USAID on that to help, especially help countries in Africa to be, help them plan if they are in danger of a famine or a drought in a certain cycle. Next, please. This year, I'm excited to announce that I'll be helping to start a food security office at NASA Goddard, and there is an opportunity for groups uh, outside. They've applied to become partners with us and to actually run a research consortium on food security. So we'll do it in partnership with our other government agencies, like the Department of Agriculture. We want to keep asking, how can we improve the way we use remote sensing data to respond to agriculture and food security? Next, please. We're focused a lot on water as well. You know, there's, uh, of course, been a drought for several years in the western part of the US. So we have a, a team at NASA at the Jet Propulsion Lab. They're leading this Western Water Applications Office. If you go to the next slide, we can see an example. Uh, things like using data to understand, uh, in this case, uh, where we have um, fields that are left 
uh, cultivated in fields that are um, actually fallow. Of course, one big major use of water in the California region is agriculture. So understanding how agriculture is using water is a major issue. Next, please. I want to highlight, too, that NASA doesn't just produce the, the complex science, but we also try to help train others to use it. So in fact, all of you could go to the website for RSET. RSET is our Applied Remote Sensing Education and Training Program. And they have a number of free uh, web-based trainings that are just webinars they've posted online. And you can just go there anytime you want, and you can watch Introduction to Remote Sensing. You can learn the basics of how we use satellite data to answer questions and put it into uh, geographic information systems, or GIS. And it's available for anyone to use, but also if you're part of an organization that needs this training, you can ask us and we can think about opportunities to work together with you. We also work closely, as I mentioned, with other countries uh, through SEVERE. And we have the DEVELOP program, which is actually a chance for people to apply to be interns at NASA and learn this kind of skill set. So keep all these things in mind. Next, please. I just want to close and highlight a few of the ways that you can get access to NASA data. We're here because we're going to have a hackathon, right? We're going to encourage people to take our data from our websites and, of course, data from other sources as well and try to solve important problems based on the challenges we've posed. And so the Earth Data website is one of the many places you can go to get a collection of a lot of NASA's data. So just earthdata.nasa.gov is a great place to start if you're exploring Earth's, uh, NASA data. If you go to the next slide. There's a few other examples here of great um, sites you can think about. Uh, we try to have a, a range. I mean, the, the PhD level scientists, they want to get the pure data and take it and just do everything they want with it. And then you know, we want to have also some tools, like the WorldView tool, for example. It's really more for just exploring. It's a map already. It's not the raw data itself, but it's a way to interact w easily with the data visually. So we try to have a range of ways to see our data. If you go to the next slide, please. I just want to close and highlight, um, NASA, of course, explores the world through space and through satellites. But we also explore through planes, through uh, putting sensors on the ground. And I was very privileged to really see a, a rare part of the world uh, by going on one of our NASA science flights. That's one of the planes that we uh, use for, for doing uh, science, meaning we can put science instruments like lasers and radars onto these planes. And I was very fortunate to go to Antarctica uh, with a NASA team. We're departing in this shot from Chile and then going to spend a day flying over Antarctica. You can go to the next picture. So this is a shot I took with my own camera <laughs> of Antarctica, which to me is just the, the powerful thing is that it's a place that very few humans see with their own eyes. And so I felt so privileged to just be able to join in this opportunity and understand how we are not just um, kind of at a distance to the Earth, but we are intimately connected to the Earth and trying to understand how things are changing and how we can take care of this very fragile part of the world. And the last slide there is just, it was very inspiring to spend that day you know, seeing Antarctica and trying to share that with others. I just want to remind you that you know, our, our planet, even though it feels like a very far away place, uh, it's a very special place that we all need to take care of, even though we may not feel like it's part of our daily life. And I'll just close with one more, sh one more slide, I think. Uh, if anyone here is thinking about opportunities with NASA for careers, please go to intern.nasa.gov because it has a combination of student programs for high school through college, as well as programs for recent graduates or those who are perhaps changing careers. Uh, and you can learn a lot about our internships there. So I just want to make sure people are aware of that. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Great. So let's continue our presentations with, uh, with Matthew. Thank you. Hey, great job. Wow, that is an awesome presentation. Thank you, everyone. My name is Matt Pierce, and um, you're going to hear some things for me about NASA's education office. And in short, my role is to help you and anybody that's interested for, through formal and informal education institutions to have an opportunity to learn and explore and engage with NASA in meaningful ways. Um, can you hit the next slide, please? So ultimately, our goal in NASA education is to improve STEM education using our capabilities. And our capabilities are amazing. The people that work at Goddard, the, our partners and friends and collaborators that send experiments to space stations, the amazing universities that we work with. We have a very broad network of uh, engagements and opportunities for anybody that's interested in the work we do. Go ahead. Um, another snapshot of all the different NASA centers. We're going to have a little overlap in <laughs> what we had. Yeah. And, and you can see that NASA is an amazing network. And I think one of the things that fascinates me about NASA is, aside from the amazing work we do and the brilliant things we make and the awesome people that work there, are how do you get all these different centers to work together to create these achievements? And there's an amazing work culture and collaborative culture in the NASA family. 
So I encourage you to, to join us in, in any of these centers that interest you. Can you hit the next one? And as you heard before, we have about four different divisions of science, and everything we do falls into one of these four buckets, if you want to call it that, or divisions in trying to understand the world we live in here and also what's out there. And that's earth science, heliophysics, astrophysics, and planetary science. Now, our Goddard campuses, and that was a great picture that you had of the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. But you can see we have four campuses. We, we have the Goddard Space Flight Center, Wallops, which is over on the uh, Atlantic side, and that's a launch facility. The Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is where my office is. And you may recognize the diner underneath there. It was in a TV show at one time. Um, and we also have the independent verification and validation facilities. So all of our campuses work very closely with each other and have a variety of teams working on a variety of projects really focused on our technologies, earth science, space science, and exoplanet habitabilities, and, and a, a lot of great work. So at GISS, what does that stand for? The Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, we focus really on planetary climates, remote sensing of aerosols and clouds. So for example, on the plane Danielle was on, we would take that data and try to apply it to our models. And uh, global climate uh, modeling and impacts. This is our director, Dr. Gavin Schmidt. I strongly encourage you to watch his TED talk and, and if you get a chance to see him, go see him. He, he has a, a really brilliant mind and a unique way of demonstrating to audiences the complexities of the work we do in ways that even I can understand. And when you think about GIS and the things we do and, and what our climate scientists are trying to achieve and all this different data that's out there in open source, ultimately we kind of look at these perspectives. And I love this uh, visualization because it gives you a moment to really see the interdependence of the planet. And you can see how what's happening in West Africa is affecting the rest of the world. You can see the climate swells up around Greenland that may be contributing to the glacial ice sheet melting. You can see f the red dots are, f are fires around the world over a period of time. And this is real data. This is not an animation that's uh, illustrated here. Thank you. But at NASA Education, we, we have a lot of objectives. Our first goal is to inspire you, which I think NASA does a great job of and then we want to engage you and then play a role in your education, but ultimately we want to employ you. Over half of our workforce will be retiring in five years, 10 years. Um, it's hard to leave NASA <laughs> once you're there. Uh, but there is gonna be a huge opportunity for uh, the next generation to join our, our great missions. Thank you. And you've seen this one, but I just love it because it, it's a picture that really captivates a lot of what we do and what we think about and, and how we're trying to pass off the science and the discoveries that we've had to the next generation. So real quickly, some of the things our, my office offers uh, at the NASA Office of Education, we do STEM engagement activities. These are experiential learning opportunities that exist in a variety of forms. We, I, this afternoon, in fact, I'm doing an educator professional development workshop on the other side of town where we work directly with teachers and schools and districts and uh, for both formal and informal educators to elevate and bring them really cool lesson plans and, and work with them to really embrace the concept of STEM and what that means. And, and kind of in short, when you think about STEM, it's not necessarily let's have more science, more tech, more engineering and math. It's how do we use those disciplines as modalities to really solve the big problems like how on earth are we going to solve climate change? Well, we will. Um, I'm confident of that. Mm -hmm. And then we work with institutions to build capacities and, and leverage networks and, and try to really engage on a macroscopic level more opportunities for STEM. And as you heard previously, um, we run a robust internship program every summer. Actually, we have internships all year round. And again, intern.nasa.gov. And you wanna go to what's called the Aussie platform. And if you ever have an issue trying to get your application work through in there, feel free to reach out to me. And, um, one of my roles is to help you find the place you're looking for and get your application out there and, and get an opportunity to work with someone like Danielle or, or any of our other amazing uh, scientists and engineers. 
And this is just a quick snapshot of what one of my internship teams did last summer. And while NASA is looking far out into the stars and, and also close to home, this particular team is very concerned about what's happening in the urban heat island effect. So they're a unique team that's going all over New York City, testing different materials with infrared cameras to try and figure out how do we mitigate those consequences related to the urban heat island effect in response to climate change. And this one I love, I, I, I really dig astrobiology. I think it's, it's just far out there, no, <laughs> no doubt about it. But this is another one of our teams that was really trying to understand how do we find life out in, out in the universe? And what are the parameters that we want to look for? And how do we isolate the habitability zones where there might be life as we know it? Um, so if you're interested in those types of things, we do have opportunities to study those subjects as well. And this is just another picture I love. It must be the teacher in me and the science geek in me. And, and, and this is one of our other advances in technology, Robonaut, who I think is still on the space station. Second R2, not D2. <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks. And just a real quick snapshot at a few of our missions and, and then we'll, we'll move on. But GPM is a, a satellite that you may see often or the results of that work. If you're ever watching the Weather Channel or seeing a hurricane and you're seeing this awesome three-dimensional spiraling storm system and you're flying through it, seeing the different precipitation levels, that's from our GPM or Global Precipitation Measurement uh, Satellite. And we're all very excited about this telescope that we'll be launching next year, the James Webb Telescope. It's been in development for 20 years, 30 years, a long time. But it is just absolutely fascinating. Um, it's going to revolutionize the way that we look at the universe. It's going to address questions related to dark matter, dark energy, infrared energy, and show us all those amazing things we haven't seen yet. So we're very, very excited about it. But when you think about this mission, I, I, I get kind of captivated by it. So think about it. You have to build something over a 20-year period. And it's incredibly fragile, amazingly delicate. It's, a, it's a, a beautiful piece of artwork and technology. Well, then you have to pack it all up and put it in a nose cone of a rocket and ship it a mi million miles away where you can't just fly out and fix it when it doesn't work. It has to, it has to work the first time. And so many, all of our scientists and engineers and program managers and, and NASA teams are painstakingly going through the process to make sure that works. And I think we're slated to launch next year uh, if everything goes well. This is going great right now. It is. It's it is. Lovely. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we do have a new launch vehicle on the way, Orion. And we're also building the Space Launch System, SLS. And this is the vehicle that's going to take us back, to, take us to Mars and potentially back to the moon and possibly out to an asteroid as well. But it's our, uh, our, our new space launch system and uh, space vehicle. I'm really excited about that and we're anticipating doing a test launch uh, within a year, I believe. All right, so I also want to say a real thank you to all my partners and collaborators that we've worked with. Go ahead. And one thing I want to leave you with from an education perspective. In, in a NASA perspective. Like I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk, in addition to the, the amazing things we accomplish at NASA and the brilliant work that we achieve and the strong collaborations that go on there, it, it always fascinates me is how well these people work together and how well we work with other agencies and how we get these things done. But how do you do that, right? And this is, a, this is a unique study that came out of NASA when, called the System Engineering Behavior Model. And if you Google it, it'll pop right up. Um, but I like to look at it from an education perspective. And I think it captures, in a way, how, who we are and how we work together. And it requires systems thinking. It requires leadership. It requires strong communication skills. And it requires the right attitude. Um, you know, things like using your intuition, knowing what your limitations are, understanding risks, um, valuing the contributions of others. So I encourage all of you to take a look at that as you're thinking about the culture of NASA. And I use this as a, uh, a model very often when I'm working with education groups to, to really think about the culture of STEM.
Awesome. So with that, thank you, everyone. It's a real privilege to be here. If you ever need any support and education efforts, please feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you, Matthew. Oh, yes, you're up. Am Talk I live? Jeff. Oh, I am. Okay. So I, um, you know, Making Space Matter is the name of this panel. And that really resonated with me because as, a, as an astrophysicist and as a science educator, this is something that I've been thinking about my entire professional career. And I thought what I would concentrate on is more the philosophy of approach side to making space matter. And um, I think I want to start by asking folks here at Space Apps New York City, um, how many of you have read this book? Raise your hands if you've read this book. Can you, can you see this in the back? Horton, here's a Who by Dr. Seuss. This is kind of the subject matter of what I'm going to be talking about. And um, I think that the way to start this is to first of all recognize that we have um, a global audience watching this live. Uh, my understanding is up to 20,000 folks at 200 um, sites like this one around the planet are now on this live feed. And who knows how many other folks are just eavesdropping in. And so I guess what I'd like to say to you all, um, in, in terms of how do you make space matter, it really boils down to something that I learned a long time ago. It, it boils down to inspire, then educate. And in fact, that's so fundamental that it, I made it the tagline for our organization. And I think what I want to do is give you a sense of what I mean by this by starting out with the inspiration. So first of all, you all live in a house or an apartment on some continent here on planet Earth, a tiny little planet orbiting an insignificant star in a planetary system we affectionately call the solar system. And the solar system the, the, is simply the family of the sun. And the sun lives in the local solar neighborhood of a little wisp of material called the Orion Spur of the Milky Way galaxy, our city of stars. And that little wisp of material, the Orion Spur, our home, is about two-thirds of the way out from the center of the Milky Way, sandwiched between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms, uh, spiral arms of the Milky Way. And our Milky Way galaxy, our city of stars, has enough stars in it to give 50 to every human being on planet Earth. And one of those stars is the sun. And based on the revolution in planetary detection that has taken place over the last couple of decades, we now are convinced that the vast majority of those stars have planetary systems. And in fact, many of those planets, countless planets, are in the thermally habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, which is just at the right distance for liquid water to exist, which is conducive for life as we know it. And so next time you look up at the night sky, think that, I think that there's somebody looking back. And somebody looking, you know, some creatures looking off into their night sky far from here, we're looking at them. And maybe somebody at a space apps conference on that planet far, far away is saying exactly what I'm saying now. And so we live in the Milky Way galaxy. Again, enough stars to give 50 to every person on planet Earth. And the Milky Way galaxy is one of 50 galaxies in the local group of galaxies, which is adjacent to something called the Virgo cluster of 2,000 galaxies. And the local group and the Virgo cluster are all, all part of the Virgo supercluster of 100,000 galaxies. And the Virgo supercluster is one of more than a million superclusters in the tiny insignificant portion of the, of the universe that humanity is allowed to see called the observable universe. And that's your address. And I think it's high time that every human being on this planet recognize their true address because the, the world needs a sense of humility. We're a small, insignificant portion in a, in, a, in a vast cosmos. And another way to say this, I think, that brings this home is, you know, if you go to Jones Beach, which is not too far from here, and you grab a handful of sand, like my dad told me when I was like seven years old at Jones Beach, I grew up in the Bronx, and he said, Jeff, Grab a handful of sand, and Jones Beach has really, really fine grains of sand. He said, why don't you go count the sand in your hand? And I looked at him like he was crazy. And that was his point. You know, imagine really fine grains of sand in a handful, how many countless grains there are. Well, if you brought the Milky Way galaxy down where every star was a very fine grain of sand, you would fill up a box one meter by one meter by one meter. That's the Milky Way galaxy. 
And if you brought the next galaxy down as a one meter by one meter box and put it next to it and keep bringing galaxies down in the observable universe, you would build a beach one meter deep. And if you brought all the galaxies down in the observable universe, you'd build a beach one meter deep the size of the state of Colorado. And just two months ago, there was a, a research result that came out saying that we have likely underestimated the number of galaxies in the observable universe by a factor of 10, which means that you'd build a beach the size of the continental United States, and one of those grains is the sun. And we're the third rock orbiting that star. And now you might feel kind of small, but beauty has nothing to do with size because with something the size of this, Generations past have, have toiled to reveal the story that I just told you. And the word that I've come across in the English language, the only word I've come across in the English language that really reflects what I just told you is the word majesty. What I've told you is majesty. And what's really cool about this story is that you are part of the universe. You're integrally connected to it, which means that every time you go out on a clear night and you look heavenward, you are the universe contemplating itself. You got that? And so this is not a clever children's book. This is nonfiction. This is nonfiction. We are the who's in Whoville. And the kinds of questions that, that this subject matter addresses that have been questions that have been asked for generations past or where did we come from? How, how, how are we located in space and time? How did the universe come into being? Are we alone? These, these are questions that, that religion and philosophy and science have been dealing with for a very long time. And in the context of science and STEM, the way that this all works is really quite beautiful. Every generation keeps those questions alive. Every generation adds to the book of knowledge. Every generation grows frail. And every generation reaches down to the next generation and says, it's your turn to keep this alive. It's your turn to keep us going in a place where we've never gone before. And be content in knowing that everything that I've learned in my generation and everything that was passed to me by prior generations, I give to you freely. Take us where we've never been. That's the inspiration behind why making space matters. And I can tell you, I have nothing against the Food and Drug Administration. I think they do good work. But if I want to inspire the next generation, NASA is the national treasure. And all of the organizations that NASA works with, like mine, um, like Cases, Jennifer, are you here? Jennifer Lopez is here from the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space. Um, hey, Jennifer. Um, you know, all of these organizations with, with, you know, working with NASA are inspiring the next generation. And so, you know, the inspiration is the start. And when you get somebody and you grab them by the collar, Right? It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's sort of like trauma. You know, if, if your body suffers trauma, you've got to respond rapidly or you lose the patient. When you open up a curiosity window in a child, you've got to respond with education capability. You've got to give them the pathway to move forward fast or the curiosity window closes down. And so when you think about all of the space apps sites around the planet, that is how we are channeling that inspiration into creative ways to do remarkable things and take the human race where we've never been before. In my particular case, my organization is one of countless organizations that have zeroed in on specific programmatics that make sense from our vantage point. So as an example, we launched something called the Student Space Flight Experiments Program back in 2010. And the whole idea is that a community proposes how they're going to engage a, at least 300 students in the grade 5 through 16 range. So this is upper elementary, middle, or high school, or undergraduate. And they, des and they engage them in real microgravity experiment design and proposal writing. And those 300 students are broken into formal research teams of three to five students per team. And each team, just like professional scientists and engineers, will design a real microgravity program. 
and write a formal but grade level appropriate research proposal. And each of those communities, you might have 60 to 100 flight experiment proposals, which then go through a formal review process, just like professional researchers. And for each community, our, our national review board that meets at the Smithsonian selects one experiment to launch from Kennedy Space Center on a SpaceX rocket to be carried to the International Space Station where an astronaut is assigned as simply a technician to operate the experiment according to the student flight team's protocol and return it safely to Earth to the student team for harvesting and analysis. The idea is to engage students in real research right now. And we've been able to do that for 75,000 students over the course of six and a half years. So that's one example of a program that we do in, in concert with NanoRacks, a private launch services provider in the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, CASIS, which operates the US National Laboratory on the International Space Station. Now why do, I, you know, why do we create these programs? Why do organizations create these programs? In my mind, it's not about just creating the next generation of scientists, space scientists and engineers. What I want to do is I want to in entice students to go into STEM. And if they want to be doctors addressing medical um, challenges on the frontier, whatever the challenge is in STEM, if I can feed the, the, the next generation of scientists and engineers, then we have done good things. And so it's, it's a discipline independent of approach of inspiring and then educating. And so I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to say, but I just challenge everybody here, you know, and I, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, to those 20,000 folks watching this live feed, you know, it's like I'm preaching to the choir in terms of the inspiration, but maybe every once in a while a good shot in the arm does some good. So take us we've, where we've never been before. Thank you. I was struck, I was trying to find, because we have, we have three really different speakers up here, and I'm kind of more in Jeff's camp, where I do a lot of public outreach and talk to people and talks and things. But what's interesting is the goal of space apps and this whole idea is something that was mentioned by you two, and that is, let's put you to work. And so there is the interface between, uh, between the inspiration and then the education and finally getting that job or making that job occur and having that some, like we heard the previous speaker saying, I wanted to go to space, so gosh darn I ripped my own appendix out, right? This kind of, it, it's just like, wow, 48 hours after hearing you're gonna do something, you're gonna actually have your have surgery. Okay, that's, that's an extreme example, but it is an example of what it means to actually, where does the rubber hit the road? So in a certain sense, we've got two people on the stage that took a car, put it up on jacks, put a, put a brick on the accelerator and let it go. And then we walk away. Now, these guys gotta come along and kick out the jacks and see what happens to the car. Now, if you've seen that movie, you know what happens. Uh, but, the, uh, but really, it's what happens when we actually have the inspiration meet the real world, and where does it go, and what does it take us, and where do we take us? So I, I'm, I'm thinking about something I saw in my, little, my neighborhood some years ago. There was a little girl. She was walking along uh, on, in Inwood neighborhood, uptown Manhattan, and she was, she was laying down a meter stick on the road. I, I was like, what's going on? And I noticed she had a clipboard, and I thought, Oh my goodness, I know what she's doing. She's measuring the length of each of the blocks of concrete on the sidewalk. And I thought, well, no, that's, that's protein science. Now, what inspired her to do that extremely menial duty? But there's something, maybe her teacher said, go learn how long the sidewalk is. Go learn that. What does that mean to do those actions? And so we start from this inspiration, and then we have this meeting of that. And I'm, I'm sure that all three of you have found instances in your life or in others where you've seen that shift occur. Because I like to tell people, go do science. But then they go, do science. And it's like you just mentioned, there's 75,000 entrants, but only one flies. What happens to the people who try, who get there and try? What is the element of try? Because in this movie, there is try. We do try. So I'd like to have you think about that. Yes, Danielle. I'm glad you're bringing up the point because we do want to say we're not just hoping to inspire the one set of students that win your competition. We hope to inspire everyone involved. And so I want to bring up the word failure. And I want to bring up the fact that failure is a very common part of our whole career and our whole community. 
I want to mention many ways that I have failed. <laughs> and the point about failure is that, on one hand, it's scary, and it's something that causes us to feel like maybe we're in the wrong place or we're in the wrong team, but we should, and we will feel those emotions, so that's normal, so I'm not going to tell you not to feel them. <laughs> but what we can do is know in advance that we're going to fail, plan to have some friends you can go talk to and cry with when you fail, but then plan that you're going to be able to go back. When I was uh, starting gra my graduate studies, I went to undergrad at MIT and I stayed for graduate school. And you might think, oh, of course, you're an MIT student, of course, you'll be ready for grad school. But in many ways, I was not. I needed to learn how to do research. So my first year there, I was actually literally failing every day to go in and, and try to do my experiment. The equipment wasn't working. I didn't know how to fix it. And I got very frustrated. And I really just wanted to quit. And it was a case where I, I worried that I was not qualified for the job. And I worried that I was in the wrong role. In some ways, maybe it wasn't the best fit. I actually ended up finding a project later I liked better. But I, that feeling of um, not being good enough was very real for me. And I needed to have a community around me, mentors that I could go to to help me work through that. And so it's a common thing to fail. And because space is, is hard and challenging, it's all the things that are the most challenging about our, our community right now. But we often say the words failure is not an option. It's like, you know, in the human space flight, you don't want to kill people. That's what we mean by that. <laughs> but, but failure is actually very common in the space community. And we should be prepared to embrace it and even celebrate it so that we can actually uh, learn from it. We actually give awards out at NASA about failure now so that people can to know that you're going to fail and it's okay to share that story and we should all learn together from it. And absolutely, and, and just to comment on that, I love our lessons learned conversations. And, and when I first came into NASA, they scared the heck out of me. Because, I mean, who wants to say they didn't do it right at NASA? Oh, um, yeah. But, wow, what a culture of innovation and it, is, it has taught me the lesson of appreciating failure instead of running away from it. And the, the community of engagement that supports those, uh, those moments is really profound. And in terms of you know, how do we engage and, and how do we do science and how do we start this process and where do we go and how do we, how do we become a piece of it, I, I am a, a strong example of somebody who changed their major extensively. I had to follow my interests. As soon as I was bored, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to go any further in those roles, and that certainly frustrated my wonderful parents as I changed from multiple majors to other multiple majors, but I was really following what was interesting to me, and I think that's an important thing to remember. There are any number of avenues to join this science. There are any number of opportunities to engage in our missions, either through universities or non-formal education institutions, or even just through events like this, when citizen scientists come together to make great discoveries. Most of our great discoveries in the world have come from citizen scientists and at those points when they have that great aha idea. And I, I just encourage all of you to have the courage to follow those aha moments that you have. And if it doesn't work out the first time, or the fifth time, or the tenth time, come talk to us. We love to talk about failure and, and how we can learn from it. Fa that's, uh, that's interesting you turned it into that because failure is an interesting word and when you don't couple it with the blame storm, which is a frequent thing that I, because I, I, my day job is I, I teach on the weekend so I put on my education public outreach cape at night and so I do work corporate by day. And it's a very different, it's a very different world in the corporate environment where you have to really actively work against the blame storm. And, L, and every good manager knows to do that, and even good employees know how to do that. It's, a, it's an important element of attitude, as you were describing as one of your studies. Jeff, what do you think? Well, I, I think I, I'm going to push back on my colleagues a little bit here. But um, let, me, let me say that, you know, uh, first of all, with regard to failure, um, for you to succeed, you've got to fail. Failure teaches you far more than success. And when you try something and it doesn't work, you've taken real data uh, from that failure to understand, okay, that pathway doesn't lead to fruition. Um, but the way that this conversation started is you said, well, 75,000 students end up sending one experiment. Well, actually, one community is 300 students get one experiment. And then you picked it up by saying, well, but that, you know, failure is okay. And the way I have to respond to this, folks, is we're all looking at this wrong because th Exploration, human exploration, is about journey. It's not about trying to find all the knowledge that there is. We never will. It's about the, the, the act of journey, embracing the act of journey. 
And if those 300 students were immersed in the process of experiment design and exposed to writing proposals and could go to a conference at the Smithsonian and get up there on stage and present on their results, they have been immersed in journey. And so those students are better prepared for the brutal competition in the real world of STEM where scientists and engineers have to compete for resources and if we dump out our students into the workforce and then they figure out, oh wait a second, nobody told me I had to be a superb writer as a scientist or an engineer because I have to write proposals? then we as an ed education pipeline have failed them. So I don't look at any of those 75,000 students as failures. I, I, I don't really care about the experiment going to the International Space Station. I want to immerse those students in journey in STEM so that they're better capable of going into the STEM workforce by making the decisions in the future. Or for those students that are not going into STEM careers, they become scientifically literate and are future voters to make informed decisions on science and technology that affect the entire planet. So I'm pushing back. No, your pushback right? is absolutely correct because when I had my Master of Science is in astronomy and I found that I couldn't get jobs in it, so I'm working corporate finance That's my a Unix, as a Unix system administrator. That's my day job by day, which I'm playing hooky from right now. Shh, don't tell anybody. But, uh, but no, it's, it's important to learn how to apply one area to another. And I know for a fact I wouldn't have the job I did without the science and mathematics and training background that I had. It's just not possible. Thank you. So and, uh, any concluding thoughts? We we're given a three minute countdown. So why don't we do a, a quick minute of thinking, uh, some thoughts we got. Start with you, Jeff. Uh, I don't know. Joe, no. I think you made some, some fantastic points about about the nature of about that uh, about the nature of inspiring first and then letting the letting the wheels catch on the road second. Keep pushing the envelope. Keep pushing the envelope. There you go. There it is. Envelopes being pushed, especially envelopes containing money. Continue. Yes. <laughs> yes. Keep pushing the envelope and and um, you know and and dare to dream. You know we we love out of the box ideas and you would be surprised at the contributions that so many of our amazing interns have, have made and how that's affected their careers and their longevities. But don't be afraid to dream. I mean, the craziest idea, take it to the limit. And it's very interesting how you provide these educational resources. So if there's, so please do uh, encounter with, with Goddard as their education resource, because they're far more detailed than most people even realize they are. I want to encourage you guys um, not to worry too much about labels throughout your career. I have a couple engineering degrees and a policy degree, and I really love international development. I'm not quite sure what to call myself sometimes, so don't worry about it. You, I think what's cool is that our generation can, can kind of create our own career path and our own um, kind of identities for how we want to see ourselves and how we want to contribute. So just go forth and, and like solve important problems and enjoy uh, being parts of communities of people from different backgrounds. And we'll figure out what we call that later. <laughs> but uh, don't be limited by people who give either job descriptions or certain titles or career paths that they tell you this is how it works. Because we need to rethink, because the problems are so challenging these days. In order to solve these important problems, we first have to collaborate with others, but we also have to be flexible in how we even define ourselves. Can I pick up on one thing that, that Matt said about dreaming? Uh, now I have something to say. Um, Perfect. But you know, uh, th I, I think, what, what was the greatest human journey of all time to date, in terms of humans going somewhere? The moon. Apollo, right? 100,000 people were part of the team that built Apollo. And all of the people in history that, that built and flew these machines of exploration, all of the people that pushed the boundaries, here's the really important part. Were children once that dared to dream. They were all children once to dare, that dared to dream. So I wanted to thank you for making that point. Well, I'd like to uh, thank, our, thank our speakers and thank you for contributing so much and thank you, thank you for coming today. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here and please, if you bump into them, please chat with them. They're, they're amazing resources. Uh, so please visit their websites and please stay in touch with them and thank you again.